On a previous video about modified Mendelian genetics, we talked about single gene modifications to typical Mendelian inheritance, and that included incomplete dominance, that included co-dominance, and also lethal alleles. These are all one gene versions of modifications to Mendel. Today, we're going to talk about epistatic gene interactions, which are two genes with modified Mendelian, uh, not really inheritance, but sort of manifestation in their phenotype. Uh, I also have a separate video posted up on Moodle about polygenic traits, so we're not going to be talking about that on this video. We're going to be focusing on epistatic gene interactions. Epistasis refers to two genes interacting so that one gene masks or hides the second gene. Okay, So the gene that is doing the masking, that is the phenotype that you can see, is the epistatic gene. And the one whose effect gets covered up is hypostatic, epi for above, hypostatic for below, okay? So here we have two genes, uh, a gene for hair color. So we can have either a blonde hair allele or a red hair allele. We'll ignore the other hair color alleles for right now. And then we have a gene for baldness. Um, and we can either have the, um, the no baldness allele, or we can have the baldness allele. So which is the epistatic gene in this interaction? If you have the allele for baldness, it doesn't matter what hair color you have. This individual here still has the gene for blonde hair. This individual still has the gene for red hair, but we can't see that trait. The only one we can see is baldness. So the baldness allele or the baldness gene is epistatic to the hair color gene, which is hypostatic. Okay. Take a minute and think about the difference between epistasis and regular dominance and recessiveness. Pause the video and come up with a definition now. Epistasis refers to masking with two genes. So one gene is masked by the second. Dominance is referring to one single gene where, for example, the dominant A codes for a red color, the little a codes for a white color, and you can see that A is dominating over little a. You could also think of this as masking, but it's still just going to refer to regular dominance and recessiveness because we're thinking of a single gene here. Epistasis requires two or even more genes. With epistasis, each of those genes can also have multiple alleles. We've talked previously about a typical dihybrid cross. So here, we're looking at an individual with little a, little a, big B, big B. Here, a big A, big A, little b, little b individual producing two or producing heterozygous individuals that will have the wild type phenotype. Now, if we self cross or cross with another dihybrid, we would expect to see a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio of phenotypes. And from that, we can conclude that there is no epistatic interaction between A and B. However, if we see a modified 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, that would mean there is an epistatic interaction between A and B. What would a modified 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio look like? Let's first talk about what a typical 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio would look like. In this case, we're talking about the four different phenotype categories that could come from a dihybrid cross. The first category would have 
a genotype where it has two dominant alleles. The second type would be dominant for one, but recessive for the other. The second category would be the reverse of that, recessive for the first gene and dominant for the other. And the final rarest category would be homozygous recessive for both genes. Now a modified nine to three to three to one could mean that rather than seeing four different phenotype categories, we see only three. For example, 12 to three to one. So if we see three phenotype categories in a modified nine to three to three to one ratio, this 12 includes the nine and the three category. So that would mean if we use this data over here, that would mean that the 12 includes anyone who has a dominant A would have one phenotype. So A doesn't matter what's happening here at B. And then the little a categories would have two different phenotypes. Another example might be uh, 9 to 6 to 1, where these individuals would share a phenotype. If you have a if you have both dominant alleles, you have one phenotype. If you have both recessive alleles, you'd have another. And if at least one of the genes is dominant, A or B, then you'd have a third phenotype category because these sixes are underlain by both threes. Another common phenotype category, or modified uh, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, would be 9 to 7, where these individuals would be all by themselves. And then all of these guys have the same phenotype. So as long as you have recessive for one gene, you're going to have a, a different second phenotype. Now each of these types of epistasis has a different name, but for now we won't worry about what those names are. Instead, I'd like you to focus on the modification of this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 so that we have different groupings of phenotypes and that's the the major way of thinking about epistasis for us so let's start off by considering this pig problem we have two genes involved in determining pig color down here on the bottom we've got a gene called mc1r and on the left hand side we've got a second gene kit and you can see that both MC1R and KIT can have two alleles, um, dominant and recessive, so that they can have three different genotypes, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. So consider first this top question, which gene is epistatic? Is it KIT or is it MC1R? Which gene is hypostatic? So pause the video a minute, look at the data here, and let's answer which gene is epistatic. How can we figure out which gene is epistatic? Well, the first thing I want to look at is, for example, this pig and this pig. The genotype of this top pig is big K, big K, big M, big M. And then on this right-hand side pig, we've got big K, big K, little m, little m. Well, these two individuals have totally different genotypes at M, but they have the same phenotype. And that suggests that KIT, um, the dominant version of KIT, so if you have at least one big K, it's masking what's happening at this MC1R allele. It's only in the individuals that don't have any dominant Ks that we're able to see the effect of the MC1R gene, and that is when we have a dominant MC1R, we have black color, and if we have homozygous recessive for MC1R, we have a brown color. So KIT is the epistatic allele, I'm sorry, the epistatic gene, and MC1R is the hypostatic gene. So now that I've done this example of genotypes, I'd like you to take a little bit of time to think about the genotypes for all nine of these pigs 
And then to solve the problem, would it be possible for two pink pigs to produce a black offspring? And then using what you know about genetics and regular inheritance, explain why that could be possible or why it wouldn't be possible. I'd like you to look at one more practice problem here. And this is considering peanut plants. We have two forms of the plant, bush, like a little shrub, or a runner, like a vine. We've got two different varieties or strains of peanut called V4 and G2, and they both are true breeding for the bush phenotype. So we know that they're true breeding when you cross V4 together times V4, all of the offspring have the bush phenotype, and the same is true when you cross G2 with G2. They all have the bush phenotype. So we know that V4 and G2 are both true breeding. They're homozygous. So then we uh, do a second cross. We cross together these true breeding V4s and true breeding G2s. And in that F1 cross, we actually see a runner or a vine. Then when we cross two F1 runners together, in the F9 we have a nine to seven ratio, nine runners to seven bush. Given what you now know about epistasis, I want you to figure out the genetic basis of inheritance for the runner and bush phenotypes. Tell me the genotypes of these two parents. So we know that they're true breeding, but what genotypes do they each have? And then given this ratio of phenotypes in the F2, explain to me what type of inheritance is happening in this data. All right, there'll be answers to these questions and some other practice problems up on Moodle.